Morning, church. Hey, just give me a couple minutes while I make some notes for my sermon here. Um, actually, you know, you guys can probably help me with this. So, can somebody give me a color? Green. Green. I green. All right. How about a? How about a person? Luke. All right. <laughs> other Luke. Other Luke. Adjective. Anybody? That's, that's not an adjective. <laughs> Somebody didn't pay attention in English class. Okay. <laughs> yep. H-E-B. Proper. Hazy. Another. Church. And one more color. Orange. All right. Okay. Awesome. So I wrote a little something for you all today. I hope you appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, roses are green. Violets are orange. It's Valentine's Day, and my heart is filled with church. Okay. At school, we are passing out Valentine's Day cards. I made a special one for Luke this year, my, myself. I, I wanted to feel honored. Oh, oh, other Luke, actually. I made one for other Luke. Yeah. I, okay. I want them to know how run they are now how amazing they are <laughs> and how much i love their h their heb I, I love your heb luke uh, <laughs> so you guys remember those from school mad lives all right has nothing to do with the lesson today but you know something fun for valentine's day and really just to to jog your memories for all you married men um it is valentine's day you still have some time you still have a little bit of time there's the days early yet and uh, you know what? You know what single people say to each other on Valentine's Day? Happy Independence Day. Uh, 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 uh. So, um, <laughs> little, little something about me is, I guess in some ways I'm what you would consider a contrarian. I sometimes it's not that I try to go against the grain or against the flow, but it's like the stuff that everybody loves. I, I usually am like, I mean, it's all right. It's a little overrated. So I guess I was trying to think of an example of that. And the only thing I could think of was peanut butter because uh, we talked about it last night. But like everyone loves peanut butter. But really, I just more so use it as an excuse to have something to put jelly with, you know, like peanut butter and jelly toast. I mean, I eat it for the jelly, not the peanut butter, you know. So I tend to uh, lean a little bit differently than most people a lot of times. And um, so I really didn't want to talk about love this Sunday because it's Valentine's Day. You know, that's like the low hanging fruit, like, okay, too easy. Come on. But the more I thought about it and prayed about it and just the things that God has been showing me over the past several weeks and months, um, it just really fit together and tied nicely together with the idea of love. And so we're going to take the low hanging fruit today. We're going to talk about love. But before we do that, let's go ahead and start with the prayer. Father God, thank you so much for uh, that. Our heart is filled with church, I guess, you know, like we learned in the Mad Libs, Lord, that we are here together, but we are uh, enjoying each other's fellowship and company and uh, that we can just be together on this this day of love and just be reminded of your love for us and how how that should affect the way we live. Lord, I pray that you just guide us through your scriptures today. Um, I pray that your spirit would would speak through me and speak whatever needs to be heard by the church uh, today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, um, because it's Valentine's Day and I'm feeling a little romantic, I guess we'll, we'll say the sermon has three movements today, okay? Three movements we're going to look at. And the first one we're going to look at is actually a love letter. So, we're going to read a love letter, parts of a love letter. Uh, the next part is um, a poem. What's more fitting on Valentine's Day than a poem? And then the last part is a marriage or a wedding that we're going to discuss. So, those are the materials for what we're going to be discussing, and, and the topics are going to be kind of love and wine, not really wine, but a vineyard, and, uh, and the wedding, okay? So the love letter, I'll give you guys a guess. What, if I had to pick a love letter from the Bible, what, what book do you think I might pick for that? Song of Solomon is probably the easy answer, right? Well, we're not going there today. Don't worry about that. All right. We have young children in the audience. So, yeah. so what do you think? Love letter. What comes to mind? Any books of the Bible? It's a good one. He was the apostle of love, right? Great answer. Well, it's a trick question because it's not really a love letter, but it could be interpreted that way, I think. So 
most of you know that I've been spending a lot of time in First Thessalonians lately, and um, God has really uh, shown me a lot through that. And you know, when I started looking into the background of First Thessalonians and the circumstances under which it was written, it really is a love letter because the historical context for this letter is that Paul, and you can you can read about this in uh, Acts 17 in that area. But Paul and Silas, on one of their missionary journeys, they went to this city called Thessalonica. And this city was comprised of Jews, as many of these cities that they went to had some sort of Jewish establishment there. You know, they had a synagogue, but it was also comprised of a lot of Greek Gentiles. And um, Paul had gone there on a missionary trip with uh, Silas, otherwise known as Silvanus, and they planted this church, right? They started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and some people paid attention and they converted and they changed their lives, which is amazing, right? But because of the intense persecution in that city, Paul and Silas were forced to flee from the city. Anybody know how long they were in Thessalonica before they had to, to leave because of persecution? Most scholars think it was about three weeks, three weeks to a month. And you can kind of see that in the scripture in Acts. He, it talks about him being there three Sabbath days. So imagine that. Imagine you are a missionary and you go into some city who's literally never heard the name of Jesus Christ and you preach the gospel to him, and they say, yeah, okay, I'll follow that king. And then you have three weeks to raise up this church and be like, okay, peace out, I'm gone. Like, you think your chances for success would be very high, or you kind of be like, there's no hope for these guys. You know, like, I was only with them for three weeks. I mean, you think about our church, right, and how we were just blessed with, uh, well, even just the church, the planting team that came down right it wasn't just one or two guys it was it was a whole group of people and they were there doing the work for years and then of course we were blessed with matt and adriana who spent a decade here right really training up and building up the church and then you know we uh, had a transition period we had a new evangelist and then we've been without evangelists for over a year now right and i don't know about you but if i look back on the year that we've been without paid leadership um there's been some struggles right <laughs> And it hasn't been the easiest thing in the world. And you think about, uh, it's like, look at what we had, the track record leading up to where we are now versus these guys. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. They, they didn't have the New Testament. Why? Because it hadn't been written yet. Like First Thessalonians is the first letter written by Paul. And most people think it's actually the first letter in the, in the New Testament ever written. The Gospels came later, they think. So they didn't have any New Testament to go off of. They had a few sermons or a handful of sermons that Paul preached while he was there. Um, they didn't have, you know, cell phones. They couldn't say, whoa, hey, guys, just got a Snapchat from Paul. Uh, does anyone still use Snapchat? I, I don't know. Carlos uses it, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, you know, they didn't get a, a tweet from Paul saying, all right, guys, this week we're going to focus on love. And this week we're going to focus on faith. You know, it was like they literally had the three weeks with Paul and Silas and then that's it. But they were left with something. They were left with the truth and they were left with the Holy Spirit. And that was enough for them. And so much so that, you know, the reason I call it a love letter is because Paul was uh, deeply concerned about this church after he left. He, I mean, he was forced to leave. Um, remember, the house they were staying at was Jason's house and they arrested Jason. And then they had to get Paul and Silas out of there so that they didn't get killed. And so they left in a haste and a hurry. And, you know, you can just hear kind of the concern, like a, a loving father writing to his children, like, man, you know, like, I had to leave and I'm hoping you guys are okay. I had to find out about your faith. So that's why finally I sent Timothy. You know, Paul tried to come and visit the church, but he was hindered. He says he was hindered by Satan time and time again. But eventually he's like, man, I got to do something. So he sends Paul to this group of new Christians and um, he gets back a report. I'm sorry, Paul sends Timothy to this group of Christians and he gets back a report from Timothy about how the church is doing. And he's relieved and surprised to find that not only are they still hanging on, they still believe everything that Paul told them, but they're actually flourishing. Not only that, but they're facing intense persecution themselves as new Christians, and they're still flourishing. And so much so that if you look in um, First Thessalonians, you, you can tell how much I read First Thessalonians because it kind of fell out here, uh, but it makes it more convenient for me. <laughs> but um, so it says here in First Thessalonians, um, you became examples. This is in chapter one, verse seven. You became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. I mean, that would be an amazing um, praise to get for any church, right? Let alone a church that 
is suffering intense persecution and had only been planted for like three weeks by Paul. But yet they became examples to everybody else, which is amazing. It kind of gives hope for us, right? That um, regardless of if we have a, a evangelist at the moment or not, we can still be an example to people. We can still bring forth the word of God. So here's just a couple of examples of why I say that this is a love letter. Listen to the language that Paul uses when he's talking to his, his brothers and sisters in Christ. In chapter 1, verse 2, he says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Name me one person that you thank God for always. I mean, I, I struggle to think of one. I mean, I'm supposed to say my wife, right? But there are moments when I'm not so thankful for my wife, right? <laughs> um, you know, when, um, when you're driving to church and the weather conditions are not favorable and, uh, you know, <laughs> you get critiqued, right? Um, okay, moving on. So it is Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> so Paul, Paul loves these people so much. He's like, man, I make mention of you always in my prayers. That's how much I love you. And then um, going down in chapter two, verse seven through eight, this was actually a theme scripture for our church several years ago, if you recall. It says, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes, cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. So he says, you know, we were gentle among you. We cherished you like a mother, a nursing mother does her own children. Like that's how much we cared about you. We shared not only the gospel, but our own lives with you. And, you know, Paul talks about how he didn't work or he didn't uh, ask for money when he was with them. He, he just worked. So he worked night and day. And then in his spare time, he would preach the gospel to him and give him little lessons and classes. And he's like, that's how much I love you. I just, I, I don't, you don't have to pay me anything. I just want to give you the message of hope and salvation. And so then moving on in, in uh, verse 17 of chapter two, he says, but we brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. I mean, there's a lot in there, but he says, you know, we eagerly desire to see your face with great desire. And then I love this, how he says, you know, what is our hope or our joy or our crown of rejoicing? And we'd probably throw out some spiritual answer, like our hope and our joy is, you know, to be with God. And, and that's true for sure. But he says here, what is our hope and our joy and our crown of rejoicing? It's you in the presence of God. Like, that's all I care about. I just want to see you make it. And I want you to be in the presence of God in the end. I mean, listen to the love here. And then um, just a couple more examples here. Oh, and by the way, um, I, you may notice I don't have a PowerPoint today. Uh, that's because, you know, I just wanted to preach from the heart. Valentine's Day. Right. Anyway, okay. Anyway, actually, it's just that I ran out of time, I think. <laughs> so uh, chapter three, verse nine and 10 says, for what thanks can we render to God for you all, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Again, like night and day, I'm on my knees praying for you guys because I love you that much. So I think you get the point. Would you agree with me that this is a love letter after all? Maybe not the kind that Luke has written to his wife, but it's still a love letter nonetheless, right? And um, you can just see the way Paul cares for this church. So we're going to start with this love letter. We're going to pick out a couple of themes from his letter, and then we're going to carry that forward with the poem that we talked about and the wedding we talked about. So Paul, like I said, was with these people for a very short period of time. And it's kind of interesting to see what he like emphasized to them while he was there, because it's not really what I would talk about. Um, you, you read through both first and second Thessalonians, and it's um, a lot about the coming of the Lord and how, you know, like, hey, hang tight, even through persecution, Jesus is coming back, which is something we don't really talk about a whole lot. Right. But that was something that was like the pillar of his message when he went there. And um Another theme was, was definitely love and, and love and righteousness. So here's a couple of examples that I found interesting. And I think we can draw from as we as Christians, obviously, we want to love people, right? We want to be like, like Jesus in that way. So here's some things that Paul tells them. Um, in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. So if the theme today is love because Valentine's Day, um, here we got an example of Paul talking about love. He says, your labor of love. Why do you think Paul chooses 
to use those words to describe it. I thought love was like fluffy, like feeling like uh, happy roses and daisies. And, you know, w you fall in love. It's effortless, right? You don't have to make an effort to fall. You just do it. You fall in love. No, we, we know that's not true, right? Love is actually difficult. It's tedious. It's a labor of love. It takes work. It takes constant work. And uh, it's a choice, right? You choose whether or not to love. Love in the Bible is not a feeling. It's an action. It's a, it's a pattern of good behavior and good acts towards somebody else, right? It's, it's giving of yourself. So love is not just this Hollywood story that we always hear about. It's this choice and it's a labor. It's going to be, it's going to require some effort and some work. So you kind of got to know that going into it. Like this is what we're called to. We're called to love. And, and we think, man, I tried to love them. I was really nice to them. And then they didn't, they didn't say hi back to me or, you know, or they didn't appreciate what I did for them. So I guess I'm done with loving that person. It's like, no, did you expect it to be easy? No, it's going to be, it's going to be a labor. It's going to be hard work. Um, going on in chapter three, verse 12 through 13, he says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So, um, you know, today we're, we're going to just kind of share a lot of scriptures and go on a lot of rabbit trails because there's no PowerPoint to keep me on track. So um, good luck, buckle up. Right? <laughs> but there's just so much good stuff. And first Thessalonians is only five chapters. And like, if you just really sit with it for a month and let God speak to you, like he can do that with any book, of the Bible, it's just so much in every single sentence, especially in Paul's writings. Right. So um, we're going to try to squeeze out what we can here, but think about, think about the scripture. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love. So we said love is a choice, right? Love is labor. It's going to be work, but you can't make yourself love, right? That's God's job. He says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. And I think that's a good distinction because, you know, we've talked about this before. Where does love come from? Who, who is love? God is love. So are you able to get love outside of God? No, it's, it's, it's an oxymoron. It doesn't work. Like if God is love, then you have to go to God to get love. And Romans 5 talks about the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So yes, it's a choice. Yes, it's going to be hard work, but we make that choice with God. We, we choose to allow God to help us love. And he says, may God make you increase and abound in love. In uh, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, he says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So again, um, I don't, Paul says, I don't have to teach you about love. Why? Because God himself teaches you how to love. And, and we know this is true. Look at, look at the example that he set for us. Look what Jesus did when he came, not just the way he died for us, but the whole way he lived his life and how it was just a constant source of love for people, right? He was just constantly loving people. And so Paul says, you don't need me to tell you how to love. You have Jesus. You, God himself teaches you how to love. And um, random analogy that just came to my mind. But uh, so Caius, uh, now he takes showers instead of baths. He, he grew up out of bath time. And so, but after he gets out of the shower, he like, it's hilarious to watch him dry himself because he always wants to do everything, right? He's two and a half and he dr starts drying himself and he does like the exact same process that I do. Like get the, get the water out of your ears, you know, the way he uses his towel and stuff. And it's, it's like, well, of course, where, where is he going to learn how to dry himself from who he watches, right? From his dad. And, um, that's probably a lame analogy to compare to the love of Jesus, but it's like, how are we going to learn to love? love? We got to look at Jesus. We got to see how does he do it? How does he love people? So um, we, are, we are his children. We need to mimic him and model him in that way. But what I think is also interesting in that, in that passage, in both of those passages, um, in verse 10 of chapter 4, remember he said, you, you already do. He said, God himself teaches you to love, but indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. Macedonia was like, um, like a great city, right? It was like, or a great, I don't even know if it was just, I don't know if it's a country or a city or I probably should know that, but, um, but Alexander the Great was from Macedonia. I do know that. But anyway, it was a prominent place. We'll, we'll say place. It was a prominent place. And he says, you guys love everybody in Macedonia. It's like, wow, good job. Like what if somebody said, 
you know, what if uh, one of the leaders from San Antonio or Dallas was like, you know what, guys, you guys love everybody in the Valley. It's amazing. We'd be like, yeah, all right, good for us. But then what does he say right after that? He says, but we urge you increase more and more. It's like, what? I'm loving my entire city. What are you talking about? Increase more and more. But Paul says, no, there's, there's more. You can do more. You can do better than that. Like no matter how much we think we're loving, there's always more love to give, right? Because if God is love and God is infinite, then there's an infinite supply of love. And I like the word choice that Paul uses both here in both of these verses, but also in the next book um, that he wrote to them in second Thessalonians. Um, let me find it here. I think it's in, uh, give me one second. Second Thessalonians 2.13. No, that's a different one. So anyway, it's somewhere in second Thessalonians. It's only three chapters, so you guys can find it. But <laughs> he says, he says the same idea of abounding in love, increasing in love more and more and abounding. And we've talked about this in a small group study before, but what comes to mind when you hear the word abound? If you guys, you guys who like basketball, what happens when the ball goes off the court? It's called out of bounds, right? Out of bounds. So that same root word, abound, out of bounds. Paul is saying like, hey, you know, this is like the parameter. This is the court that we play on. And this is what love is supposed to look like, or this is what the world says love looks like. And here's kind of the boundaries for that love. He's saying, forget that. Go above and beyond. Go way outside of those bounds. He says, let your love abound, which literally means to overflow, right? Think about a river abounding over the banks of the river. Like that's how our love should be towards each other and toward, toward everybody, right? And um, a, good, a good example of this is in the, the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, because we think about that story and our takeaway from that is we need to love people. But if you really dissect like what this Samaritan did for that guy that he found on the road, I mean, he, he, said, he, he goes over to him, first of all, he goes out of his way, he stops his busy schedule. He makes sure he's like, are you okay? He, you know, so there's another love check mark, right? He bandages his wounds, check mark. He puts him on his donkey and he rides him to the, the inn, check mark of love, right? He, he pays for the guy to stay there. But this is the one that always gets me. He actually stays the night with this guy to make sure that he's okay. Like most of us would be like, hey man, here's 20 bucks. Good luck. I hope you feel better. I got some stuff to do, right? But no, this guy stayed at the inn with him. Then the next day he pays the innkeeper extra and he says, oh, and by the way, if you run out of money, if that's not enough to get him well, just put it on my tab. You know, I'll come back and pay the rest later. It's like every step of the way, this guy went so far above and beyond what we would consider loving and what we're supposed to do for other people. And this is what Paul's calling us to. He says, abound in your love, increase more and more. You may think, you know, I'm a pretty loving person, but there's more. There's more we can do, right? We can abound in love. And that's when the world's going to take notice, right? So... Those are just some ideas from the love letter, okay? And, and I encourage you, read First Thessalonians, read Second Thessalonians, and really just dwell on them. That There's so much good stuff in there, and um, it can teach us a lot about love. But next, I wanted to transition to the poem and the, the romantic poem that we're going to read. It's found in Isaiah 5. And I'm just going to read, um, we'll do verses 1 through... Six, and then we'll take a pause there. So Isaiah 5, 1 through 6, it says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. So see, we already see right off the bat, it's, a, it's addressed to my well-beloved, right? My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. And he also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be burned and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that no rain, that they rain, that they rain no rain on it. So 
we have God talking about his vineyard here. And his vineyard is his people Israel, right? The ones he chose. And he says, you know, I picked a fruitful, fruitful hill to plant this vineyard on. And I dug up all the stones, made sure it was ready to go for my vineyard, built a wall around it. I built a watchtower in it. You know, I cared for my vineyard. I, I planted the choicest vine. But then what happened? What did he expect to find in his vineyard that he did not find? Good fruit. He wanted good fruit from his vineyard, which is not unreasonable to expect, right? He did all this hard work. And he even says, hey, judge between me and my vineyard. Did I do anything wrong? Like, what more could I have done to make good fruit in this vineyard? And so, you know, the question is, what was the fruit that he was looking for? If, if, if he planted and he made all this work and then he still got grapes, it just wasn't the grapes he was looking for. Well, what was he looking for? In verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So the fruit that God was looking for was justice and righteousness, right? That's the fruit he's always looking for. And, you know, it's interesting as we talk about fruit, because what is the most common or popular passage in the Bible about fruit, fruit of the Holy Spirit. Pop quiz. Galatians 5. There you go. Good job. So the fruit, the fruit, we always talk about the fruit, the fruit, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Like we, in our culture, we say the fruits of the Spirit, right? Like, because there's nine of them, right? There's love, joy, peace, patience. So we think, oh, there's all these fruits. But in the actual original language, it's one fruit. It's singular. And it says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And how does that love express itself? In peace, kindness, joy, patience, which makes sense, right? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind, love is patient, right? Those are fruits of the spirit, which is the fruit of love. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that all throughout the Bible, you see this theme of love. What is love? Love is righteousness. Love is treating people the correct way, the way you're supposed to. It's, uh, it's doing justice. It's seeing oppression and doing something about it, right? It's, that's what love is. And I love this passage a little bit later on in, in Isaiah 5 because it says, and I'm actually going to read the, uh, actually, I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll read the NIV. I was going to have a volunteer do it, but I realized you guys couldn't hear it. <laughs> so let me, let me get this for you. The NIV, and it's in uh, Isaiah 5, verse 16. Well, I'll read it in the New King James first. It says, But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness. I forgot I turned my phone on airplane mode so it wouldn't be buzzing. So now i got to look it up again. Give me one second. All right, so this is going to be Isaiah 5, 16 in the NIV. It says, But the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. The reason I love that is because this is saying that the reason God is, is holy is because of his righteous acts. It's because God is, you know, holiness is set apart, right? It means separate, unique, distinct from everyone else. Why is God distinct from everybody else? Because he's righteous. He always treats people righteously. He always does the right thing for people. No matter what the circumstances are or how he feels that day or whatever, he always treats people right, righteously. And that's actually what makes him holy. It's what separates him from everybody else. So in the same way, when we're called to be holy, what does that mean? It means we need to treat people righteously. Because if we are that way, are we going to look different than the world? Like the, the very thing that makes us holy is what separates us from the world is being loving towards others and treating everyone with righteousness. And we even read this verse in uh, First Thessalonians, but it says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. Why? So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So what Paul's saying there is, look, God's going to be the one that makes you increase and abound in love. And that is going to make you established in blamelessness and holiness. Like that's his definition there. Do you want to be holy? 
Just accept the love of God and give that love to others. That's what will make you holy and set apart. And I think that's a beautiful thing, you know, especially talking about fruit. You know, we've talked before, like you can't force fruit to happen. You can't make fruit happen, right? You can, you can let it grow or you can stifle it, but you're not the cause of that production. In the same way, we just got to love, let the love of God grow in us. We got to go to God to receive that love. And then we got to keep allowing it to, to flow through us. And, um, you know, Jesus even talks about the, the parable of the vineyard. He kind of takes it and expands upon it in Matthew 21. And um, it's, it's just cool how all of this stuff like feeds together because we're about to read Matthew 22, which is literally right after Matthew 21, right? And then um, we're going to talk about the wedding. So um, it's pretty cool how it all ties together, at least for me. I don't know. Maybe you guys will think it's cool. You can decide afterwards, but uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and read Matthew 22. So we're transitioning. That was our poem. It was a beautiful poem, wasn't it? And now we're going to read Matthew 22. All right. I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were involved or invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my, ox, my oxen are fatted, cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready. It's kind of funny, right? That like he takes the time to destroy the cities and the wedding's still like, oh, we still got everything ready. Let's go do it, right? Um, he, he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many of, as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bring him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. So we're familiar with this parable, right? But one thing um, that used to always puzzle me was, I don't really get it. Like you invite all these people in the good and the bad, right? You don't make a distinction. You're just like, hey, all are welcome. Come on in. And then everyone comes in and you're like, what are you doing here? You don't got, why was this guy kicked out? Cause he didn't have a wedding garment on. Right. And you're like, what? I, I don't get it. I thought you were accepting everybody. Why did you just now change your mind? Is, is God bipolar or what's going on here? But he's not bipolar. Let me just clarify that. Right. Uh, uh, so w w what's the deal here? Well, one time um, I was reading in revelation and here's another little interesting thing. I think, uh, what is, so we call it the book of Revelation, right? Or some people even say Revelations. They put an S on it, but there's no S there. But um, it's actually the revelation of who? That's what you think. John wrote it. But what is the actual title of the book? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus was the one that gave this parable in Matthew 22. And then we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, which comes from Jesus, right? In Revelation 19. And, and it's also about a wedding. And, and there's also mention of garments. So let's just take a look here. Revelation 19. We're going to read verse 7 and 8. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And I'm going to stop there for a second. So again, we have a wedding, and we have the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. And we had... A king and his son. Who was the son? In the parable in Matthew 22. The king and his son. Who's, who's the son in that story? Getting, getting married. Jesus, right? God is the king, the father, the son. So the son and the lamb. They're, they're both Jesus, right? Would you agree with that? Okay. And if they're both Jesus and it's a wedding, it's probably his wedding in both cases, right? I'm just trying to get you on the same page that we're talking about the same event here. And you can do more research if you don't believe me. But it says the, the, the bride made herself ready and was uh, arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And we didn't read this part, but what is the fine linen? What is that garment? 
It's the righteous acts of the saints, right? Well, that's kind of interesting. So the reason, so everyone's welcome, right? Everyone come on in. But then this guy didn't have a wedding garment on, which we see here. What, what is this garment? It's the right, righteous acts of the saints. So it's what we've been talking about. It's love. It's treating people correctly, the right way. And another thing that's very interesting that I, um, and I was just going over some notes this morning and it dawned on me. So I wanted to look it up and I was like, I wonder who provides those wedding garments traditionally in, in these weddings that Jesus is talking about. Well, it turns out that the bridegroom is the one that provides the wedding garments to the guest. So it's like, ah, oh, okay, that makes sense, right? Because we don't have any of our own righteousness. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But where do we get that righteousness from? Jesus. We put on Jesus. We put on, you know, we clothe ourselves in righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. And he's the one that provides that for us. So the reason this guy got kicked out wasn't because he wasn't good enough. Remember, there's good and bad in there. It wasn't, it was because he chose not to put on those, oh, you're going to give me a robe to put on? Nah, I don't want that. I don't need that. So that was the reason, like he chose not to. And if, if you look back in the parable of Matthew 22, um, the, the initial guests that were invited, what did Jesus say about them? He said, they were not worthy, right? What made them unworthy? The fact that they weren't willing to come, that they did not make that choice, right? So really, again, it just comes down to a simple choice. Like, are you going to come to the wedding? And are you going to put on what Jesus gives you to put on? That's it. That's the question. And so then at the end of here, it says many are called, but few are chosen. I can't validate this because I don't speak Greek and I couldn't find it. I, did, I didn't look long enough this morning, but I think, I wonder if that last line, many are called, but few are chosen. If you could also translate it as many are called, but few will choose, right? Maybe it's like, hey, you're all called. You're all invited in, but are you going to choose to love? Are you going to choose to put on the garments of righteousness that God gives you to put on? Or are you going to be counted not worthy, not because you're bad or you're evil, which we all are, but because you chose not to come to the wedding, right? So again, it goes back to, it's not us. We can't produce this love. And if you read through First and Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about uh, in two places, he said, you believed the word which effectively works in you, which effectively works in you who believe. So the word is working in us. And then later in Second Thessalonians, he talks about how you're sanctified through the spirit and belief in the truth. So we see the spirit and the word working together in us to produce that love in us, which makes sense because like we said, the fruit of the spirit is love. And Romans five, God pours out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. So, you know, we can get caught up in thinking like, okay, here's the bar, right? Paul says love and increase in love and abound in love and you're loving your whole city. That's great, but do more. And we're like, dude, it, it was hard enough to love my own city. Now I have to love more. Come on. That's an impossible standard. And it is impossible in our own efforts. But if we don't, we, we always get caught up in that. But if we, if we step back and realize, wait a second, Jesus is the one that gives us the garments. We ourselves are taught by God how to love one another. Like we can do this guys, not, not we, but the spirit in us can do this. We can love more and more and more. And that's what we're called to. We're called to be a people that love and that's actually the thing that's going to set us apart. That's what makes us holy or unique or different. Because remember, Jesus said, the world will know that God sent me because of your love for one another. So, you know, I was thinking about all these thoughts. And um, most of you, I think, know by now. But uh, my family and I are going to be moving to Round Rock next month. Um, so we're going to be closer to Rita's family. And, uh, you know, it's, it's bittersweet. Some people are against that decision, it sounds like, but <laughs> most of you are probably like, yeah, well, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we made that decision. And a few mornings ago, I was, I was kind of thinking about some of these thoughts and praying and, and it just kind of started, you know, some of these memories kind of flooded back to me. And I remembered um, what my first impression, what our first impression, me and Rita, was of the church when we first got to the valley. And um, we always would say, man, they love each other. Look at the love of this place. Like you come in and you instant feel, instantly feel loved. And so I just wrote down a couple examples and I know I'm going to leave people out, but I don't mean anything personally by it. I'll just give you some high, the highlight reel, right? So um, when we were first, we were living in Reynosa and we were coming across every once in a while, uh, Matt and Adriana said, Hey, yeah, come over, spend some time with us, you know, get to know the church and um, you know, the campus ministry and, and, I just remember the way they opened up their lives and their home to us, you know, kind of like second Thessalonians, you shared your, the gospel and your lives with us. And more so than just that, they, uh, their Adriana's father had an apartment 
that he moved. And so it was empty for a little bit. And I said, Hey, anytime you want to come across, so you don't have to go back and wait on the bridge and all that, you know, on a Wednesday night, just stay at the apartment. So they let us use the apartment for free, which was awesome. Right. And then I remember, I, I actually distinctly remember, uh, I think it was like our first Sunday being here before we even got into the church, we're in the parking lot and this tall, bald guy, like makes a beeline for us. It's Kirk. If you didn't know, it was Kirk. <laughs> and, uh, he just like instantly went up to us and just like wanted to, wanted to know us, wanted to know, you know, just, just talk to us, just welcomed us, let us in. And this was before we even got into the doors. Right. And uh, of course, since that time, you know, numerous lunches and house visits and just different things like that. Um, another memory I have uh, about love, people showing love, Joe and Crystal in their Bible talk, um, because at the time they had six new babies in their Bible talk. Uh, imagine giving a Bible talk lesson with six babies screaming, crawling around. And uh, at one point, um, we, we like to joke about one time when Caius was kind of learning to talk and stuff, and Joe was preaching his little lesson. And Caius walked up right in front of him and just started heckling him and just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I, I felt kind of bad, but it was pretty funny too. So uh, I just let it go on, I think. <laughs> so, you know, I think about Joe and Crystal and opening up their home, uh, taking on a Bible talk that has six babies in it, you know? And then um, Luke and Jessica, I, I think we're up to like 97 boxes of clothes we've gotten from them, something like that maybe. <laughs> you know, the hand-me-downs, um, just always being willing to give and generous in that way. And uh, Chris and Mona, we got a crib from them that Kaya still uses to this day. And I think we're going to have to upgrade to a toddler bed before long here. But, you know, they, they gave us toys and crib. Um, here's another one. I, actually, Freddie and Brittany allowed me to help them purchase their home. And I, I think they know, but they might not know, but that was my first transaction ever. And to me, that was like a loving thing to do. Like, we're going to let this guy who d doesn't know anything about this do it. And I think they overpaid by, you know, a couple hundred grand, but no worries. <laughs> no. But, you know, and just thinking the domino effect of that, um, transaction actually that transaction on the other side of the transaction the ones representing the sellers are now my current broker and just the relationship that was formed there and just you know it's amazing how God opens doors and works through things so I think about that and, and that was a loving act so um, oh so so out of all those examples that I just described uh, which ones of those were the most spiritual all of them or none of them, right? <laughs> like they're not spiritual things. Like just, um, just talking to someone, just opening up an apartment to like, that's not a spiritual thing, but it was very loving. Right. And I think, again, we get trapped in this mentality in this Christian upbringing or whatever about like, we always have to spend our time doing all these super spiritual things. And that's how we love people. And it's like, no, that's not, that's not what love is. Love is giving of yourself, giving of your time, giving of your resources, you know, spending time with people and all those examples that came to mind. I mean, they're, they're great things, but they're not spiritual things necessarily. And so that's why I didn't share this next example. I wanted to save it so I could make that point real quick, but then I got to call out my, my brother, Roberto Melendez for all the, we, we love to use the WhatsApp voice memos. And uh, so we'll say a prayer and leave it for the other one. And and then we started praying through the Psalms together, and it's been awesome. Uh, and I've been slacking the last couple of weeks on that, so I'll probably need to send that in the next day or two. <laughs> but um, that one's a little more spiritual, I guess, right? Praying through Psalms. But still, it's a very loving thing to me uh, to have, uh, you know, somebody to, to do that with. So, you know, it's uh, in thinking about, you know, our, our move next month, and um, it's a bittersweet thing because you guys really do love each other. And I was just thinking about the church and just, that's what, that's what drew us in at, at, at the start, at the beginning. Like we saw this love and in the same way that Paul said, man, you guys are rocking it. You guys are, everybody knows about you and your faith and your love, but you know what? Abound, increase more and more. And I think about all the ways that everyone here has loved each other, but there's more we can do. You know, there's maybe we've let, in, we've let little things in and we've let, different situations and circumstance kind of take our eyes off of the way we're supposed to be loving each other. And I would encourage you, no, that's not who we are. We are a people that love each other because God loves us. And let's continue to just increase and abound and expand in that love in the same way that Jesus did for us when he came and he gave it all. He gave literally everything. He, 
He spilled his blood for us and he loved us. He showed us how to love one another. So I would encourage you, man, you guys are awesome. You love each other, but let's love each other just a little bit more. And let's keep increasing and abounding in love. So um, with that, I'll do communion. Yeah. All right. So as we as we think, think about love, we think about the ultimate sacrifice and, and the way Jesus gave. Let us go to prayer uh, for communion. Father God, uh, thank you so much that you are love and, and it's you just want to give that love to us. You want us to have that love, but you also want us to spread that love to others. And you chose the church to do that. You chose us to be your vineyard. You you planted us, Lord. You you take care of us. You cherish us um, as a, a mother, a nursing mother does her children. Lord, you're so good to us and you constantly provide for us. You're constantly working in us. God, I pray that we could just make that choice to first of all, come in, that we would come to the wedding, that we would be your people, we'd be your vineyard, that we'd allow you to do that hard work in our lives, um, breaking up the soil, you know, whatever is needed, that we'd first of all say, yes, you can do that, and that we would be people that take on your righteousness, God. And Jesus, you you showed us um, so vividly on the cross what, what love looks like, what righteousness is, and Lord, we just want to mimic you, and that way we want to remember you. So we thank you, Lord for the body that your body that was broken and also your blood that was shed for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I know some people separate the prayers, but I prayed for them both, so feel free to dive into both. At this time, I'll go ahead and say a prayer for the contribution, so if you'll bow with me. Father God, thank you for, um, you know, one facet of your love is your generosity, and you are the most generous entity in the universe, God, and um, I pray that we could become more like you in that way, to also be generous and to give, um, you know, maybe maybe things are tight right now and we don't necessarily have the financial resources, um, but I pray that if we don't, we'd find other ways to give, give our time, give our, our prayers and our attention to people, but Lord, um, for the ones that you have blessed with financial resources. I pray that we would be generous with those as well, God, and that you would you would bless and multiply the gifts that we give and that you would use it completely for your glory and that you would just open up, continue to use our gifts to open up doors uh, to show love to others, God, that we can, we can be people that love not just the Rio Grande Valley, but that we love everyone everywhere in all places, God. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Happy Valentine's Day. Amen. Uh, Luke and Rita have been such a tremendous uh, asset uh, to our family, to our church family. Uh, the love and, and sacrifice and just service, they've always just been a family. They moved down to Reynosa because they love people. They wanted to serve and they've been doing that every step of the way. And brother, we're going to miss you guys. We're going to miss, uh, having Caius, you know, up here and, and singing and, and, uh, on Wednesdays, the brothers get together on Wednesdays and, and sing. And I just absolutely love it. Cause Caius is there just dancing and, and singing and, uh, he really lights up the room. And so we, we, we will love you. Uh, we will miss you guys. We absolutely love you. You know, I thought about today's lesson, and if if I don't have a connection with God, it's going to be really difficult for me to know how to love somebody. And what what things? Uh, what is God? How is God nudging me to love every day? How is He pushing me and showing me how to love every day? Uh, just got a couple of announcements here. Uh, there will be women's midweek this Wednesday. Uh, woo -woo. 
Women's midweek will be this Wednesday. Uh, for the singles and campus men, we will still be meeting on my Zoom link um, on Wednesday night. The February the 26th, for the campus and singles, we will be having a movie night uh, here at the building, socially distanced, uh, but not in our hearts. Amen. And uh, we want to definitely continue in our prayers uh, for Jojo England. Um, she is making incremental progress, and we want to continue to pray for her in, in just the progress that she's making. Um, she is having a very, very difficult time uh, battling COVID, uh, but all the, there's so many people that are battling COVID, uh, but let's continue to keep everyone in our prayers. We're going to close out with one final song.